I'm Genevieve Randall with Nebraska Public Media, pleased to support Lincoln Symphony Orchestra with these pre-concert chats. LSO concerts are, by the way, recorded as well, which means the entire state of Nebraska may have the opportunity to hear this or other past concerts on our occasional Nebraska concert series. For this concert tonight, we finally get to finish celebrating Beethoven's 250th birthday from 2020. And we also get to hear the orchestral premiere, I'll, we'll talk more about why I'm emphasizing orchestral, um, of a choral work by one of our guests here, Jake Rinestad. So joining us, Jake Rinestad, composer and the maestro Ed Polichick, Lincoln Symphony Orchestra Music Director. Great to talk to you, to both of you tonight about this concert. Oh, thanks so much. Thanks for having us, Genevieve, first of all. And it, it's such an honor and such, it's so, so I've been looking forward to this, to be able to share some time with Jake Runestad because uh, he and I knew each other when we were both at Peabody. Um, uh, I was on faculty at this point. I, I, I go back into the 1800s. So it was, it was really... <laughs> In the night, in the late twentieth century, that I got to meet Jake. And wait, and, what are you trying to say about me, Ed? <laughs> <laughs> no, you're just a you're just a young man. But I, I, I will I will tell our our listeners, our, our, our audience, that uh, Jake Ronestad is one of those uh, outstanding talents that you only come across every just very so often. Uh, or I should say very seldom that that that, that a, a musician and a craftsman of that caliber comes uh, through our our lifetime and he's proving himself time and time again um, even the some of the critics in the newspapers calling him the choral rock star and I think it's it's an apt apt uh, uh, description because uh, Jake Ronestad is, I think, one of our great 20th slash 21st century composers, uh, and his his field is broadening. And those who are going to hear this uh, evening's performance are going to be witnessing something very, very special. Absolutely, I will agree. I have to fangirl just for a second, Jake, because <laughs> we do play like, quite a bit of your music on um, during our classical hours. Uh, awesome. And you know, your choral music is something I would say is spiritual and not just in a religious sense, but in the sense of inspiration, right? That's that root of the word in that um, I think anybody can find something to be inspired by in your music and the way that you set the music, which I think is going to be especially true hearing this piece tonight. So, so let's clarify first, it's called A Silence Haunts Me. Uh -huh. And before we talk about the, the roots of this and the text that you have set, this, this is a different version that's getting its premiere tonight. Right. The, well, first of all, great to be here. Um, thank you for the kind words. Um, it, was, it was really special to, to be a student under Ed uh, when I was at Peabody and to sing in a choir in his direction and sing like choral orchestra music, which was so influential for me, you know, that I'm now writing. Uh, and so it was important to have those experiences. So I'm, I'm just so, so grateful. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so this piece, The Silence Haunts Me, was originally scored for solo piano and choir. And uh, as I'll talk a little bit about the, the genesis of it a little bit later, but this is actually a newly orchestrated version. So there's still going to be piano, but now it's with the full orchestra, which is the same instrumentation as Beethoven Ninth Symphony, which is also on the concert. And so the connection there is A Silence Haunts Me is a piece about Beethoven. It's a setting of a letter that he wrote to his brothers that they found after his death, having never been sent. And in the letter, he admits his deafness. He talks about taking his own life, but it was his art that sustained him, that kept him going. And so this, this piece is an adaptation of that letter, which was in German and now uh, I had a poet, uh, Todd Voss, who I work with a lot, adapt the letter into English and create like a dramatic monologue that is for uh, choir and piano and now also for orchestra. And I use a lot of Beethoven's music in it. And it's it's just this this dramatic journey through Beethoven's psyche of what he was thinking about as he was coming to terms with the idea that he was losing his hearing. You know, what is his most important sense? So in, in essence, we're hearing Beethoven through the choir. 
Yeah, and, and the orchestra, right? And and the words, absolutely. Yeah, that he's speaking to us. So yeah. I, I don't, reading the Heiligenstadt Testament, I, I highly recommend it for anybody. If, if, if um, you're hearing us talk about this thing, Google it, look it up, um, look up translations and read it. it. It's amazing to see the transformation that Beethoven makes because I, you're right, Jake, I think from what I've read and when I've looked through it, it's like at the beginning, you know, this is a suicide note and he changes his mind midstream, right? Mm. And doubles down, like this is even more reason to continue to compose. Mm -hmm. Do you, you yeah. agree with that? I think so. Yeah, I think this was a really important turning point in his life. Um, you know, he wrote the letter uh, a year after he wrote this ballet, Creatures of Prometheus. And so I imagine him as an artist thinking about himself like Prometheus, who, you know, gifted humankind fire and then was punished by the gods. So if he's like Prometheus, he's gifted humankind the fire of his music, but was punished with this deafness. And so I think from that moment, it was, uh, well, since this is happening, I'm just going to keep pressing on. And I think in some ways it also, I think he gave himself permission to push the boundaries more because of that reason. He's like, well, I don't know what's going to happen to me. I don't know if I'm going to die early. I don't know how much longer I'm going to have any hearing. So I'm just going to go and I'm going to write and I'm going to push boundaries. And, and I think his music shows that that was really what was happening. It gave him the freedom to, to enter that period of creativity <clears throat> that yeah. no one else had done up to, uh, there to four. Um, he right. was about 32 years old, I think, when he wrote this. It was in 1802. 1802 um, yeah. And I, mm -hmm. I, I was younger when I actually read it. It was late, late teens, early 20s. I remember it being very emotional for me to read this. And I, because I was so, I've always been into Beethoven. I mean, there's not been a period in my life when I, I can remember not being into Beethoven. He uh, had broken down so many barriers and opened up so many doors um, that based on what had uh, the music and, and the culture that had previous, uh, that, that he relied upon as a classical music uh, <clears throat> composer, I don't mean uh, classical music, I mean the classical period of music, composer, tremendously influenced by the Baroque um, going into it. So you have uh, a, a man who had all of this knowledge, I think, of, of the Baroque and the classical period up to this point, and he found it necessary to, to continue to bash through that and open up basically the door to the romantic period and the yeah. periods that followed. Um, I find this program incredibly emotional. I find it spiritual and I find it inspirational, but it, it, for me, it's a very emotional one because of the Heiligenstadt Testament, um, what it means, what it says, uh, and how you have, Jake, how you have, uh, uh, through Todd Boss's libretto, um, fashioned it in a way that makes reference to Beethoven, but also, uh, and it'll be very apparent to people, and 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 maybe not so apparent in other uh, to, to, to other people. But you cannot miss the fact that it's the music of Beethoven that is woven through this very emotional time in Beethoven's life. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know how many people are aware of the fact that um, Beethoven, uh, Ludwig von Beethoven and his brothers had a terrible father who was a drunk and who used to beat them. And one of the ways that, that, that Beethoven's father beat Ludwig was by smacking him on his ears. I mean, just, which they think could have had a major reason why he lost lost his hearing, you know, because he, he would bleed from his ears. I, it, it's just a very uh, 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 heart-wrenching uh, letter. Um, and I love the fact that, as you, you said it earlier, Genevieve, there's a turning point in that letter. <clears throat> and, and, and it gives us, you know, that hope that, that or, or the human nature aspect, that there is always that wee bit of hope that maybe this is the reason, and if not, I will do what my destiny tells me to do anyway, you know? So when you when you take that, and at the very end of your piece, Jake, the way you 
you bring in octaves, that wonderful melody of the fourth movement of the Ninth Symphony. But it's just a, a, a small fragment of it, but unmistakable. Mm -hmm. um, and it just simply disappears. It's the perfect partnership for the Ninth Symphony. It really is. It's really quite beautiful. Jake, you're a genius. And <laughs> I, I, well, I, I, you know, I, I need to say this. I think people need to know, and, and they will be witness to it tonight when, in listening to your piece and then helping us take that inspiration, that spirituality, and lead us into what ultimately Beethoven was all about. Even in his total deafness, he writes something like the Ninth Symphony. It's, it's just amazing, just amazing. It, it's an extraordinary story of, of, like you said, of human triumph, right? I think we're so drawn to these, these hero stories, and this is such a unique hero story, yes. right? Of, of overcoming um, this kind of, of loss, uh, especially because of who he was, you know, that music was his life. I can't imagine what it would be like to lose my hearing. I just can't imagine. I mean, like him, I would probably think my life was over. Yeah. Um, and I don't know that I would want to go on. And um, so I think the hope is that this, that A Silence Haunts Me kind of sets the stage and helps people maybe empathize more deeply with what state Beethoven was in when he created this symphony, right? So it's kind of informing, setting up Beethoven, and then we, we hear the ninth within that context. And he chooses the Schiller text, which is so celebratory, so yeah. positive, not really religious, but certainly looking to a higher power and the father who is over us all, you know, mm -hmm. uh, uh, looking out for us and whom we aspire to be like um, with, and with such joy and such celebration I still picture the debut of the Ninth Symphony with Beethoven standing next to the conductor uh, because he, could, he couldn't conduct because he could, could not hear. But he was out on stage and he was gyrating with his body and his hands and all, uh, along with the vibrations that he was feeling. And of course, at the very end of the symphony, he is back, Beethoven's back was to the audience. He didn't know that it was over. And his eyes closed and he's gyrating to this, this, this music. And it was the mezzo who had to go onto his shoulder and turn him around to show that it was over and look at what you have created, the inspiration in all of these people screaming and yelling, none of whom, none of which he could hear, but he could at least witness. I, I always, I, I get very emotional. I, I cry at the end of this yeah. symphony. And, yeah. and so you, you've set it up really in a, in a, in a most, most unique and miraculous way, Jake. I, I, I just love it. I really, yeah. I think it's it's brilliant, absolutely brilliant. Thank you. Thank you. I just looked up recently the last stanza of that Schiller poem because um, Strauss borrowed from it too. There was a waltz that he titled "Be Embraced, You Millions," which is how the last stanza starts. And Ed, you you referenced part of that in in the next couple of lines. It's something like, um, "Brothers, surely above the starry canopy, there there must be a father above," or something like right. that. Right. Exactly. And so, yeah, it's uh -huh. all this all this humanity in this. I just, Jake, this is not the first time that you have set music that really delves deep into the, the human experience like this. Something that we can all connect with and find hope in. Um, what, is there something in particular that draws you to that? And how, how do you approach some of these sensitive texts like that? You know, I, I think that, um... For me, music isn't just about the sound, but it's about, uh, you know, art is a form of communication. And, and I think I'm interested in what is it, what is it like to be a human living at this point in history, you know, in the world today? And how, how can I speak to that experience in a way that hopefully brings people in? How can I foster empathy um, by learning other people's stories, by expressing certain emotions? So for me, those, those kinds of things are really important. Um, and I think it comes from a young age of my parents kind of instilling a sense of service to others, generosity to others. And so then when I began to create music, I kind of brought those two worlds together. 
And so I really think of my music as a service to us as a human culture at this at this moment. So those that's why I'm kind of drawn to these kinds of things. I love that. Well, we can't wait to to hear how your piece sets up Beethoven's Ninth. And then, of course, everybody talks about the end of Beethoven's Ninth. I mean, it's the most famous part of the Ninth. But Ed, I wonder if you could give us a little bit of what to look for and what to listen for in this massive lead up to these giant forces that Beethoven pulls in at the end of the Ninth. This is a... Uh, uh... This is a magnificent work, unlike any work that has ever been written before its time. And I don't know of another work that actually equals it since his time. It's late in his life. It's Opus 120, 125, written at the exact same time that he wrote the great Mrs. Solemnus, which is, of course, a very kind of religious work, although I don't think Beethoven looked at it that way. He looked at it as a dramatic work of great inspiration. I think, you know, who knows, but the, 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 the point being that the scope of the symphony, and it's not just that he added the chorus, but also the length of it, which is about an hour long. My, my Tempe, like Beethoven's, I would shorten it slightly because <laughs> I, I, I tried to use his, as close to his uh, metronome markings as possible, but um, his his construction of the symphony as well is very different than any others of his symphony, which in the four movement structure that we know of that was kind of codified by Haydn, opening movement on the faster side, second movement slow and lyrical, third movement either minuet or scherzo, last movement the finale rondo or joyous what a fast, you know. He switches the middle movements in this case. His second movement is not the slow lyrical movement, but it's the scherzo. And it's the very famous scherzo um, that uh, was used on a NBC, ABC News, I think it was. Um, and which the Russians then took uh, into their structure of a, of, of a symphony. And then he does the third movement as the lyrical one, which really sets up what I consider his late period, uh, particularly the, the late string quartets. I mean, it is so obvious that this is what's going on. And it's actually a variation movement of which Beethoven is tremendously, tremendously famous for, for his variations. And then opening, and I have to do the, from the third movement to the last movement, really ataka because the, la the third movement ends in B-flat major. And the last movement opens supposedly in D minor. But the actual chord is a juxtaposition of B-flat major and D minor in a 6-4 version. And it's the most dissonant thing that is shocking. And that has to go. Uh, he doesn't mark it that way, but I think it has to go ataka. And it's one big recit, first in the orchestra, the cello and the bass become the, like the bass uh, singing, the vocalist, soloist, and as an entire sections, the bass and the cello and the bass do this whole recit, which then the bass soloist takes up. And then it finally opens up into the famous melody that we know. It's just, you know, it's, and, there, 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 the challenges that are presented to the players in the orchestra from the downbeat to the last note, um, you, there is not one microsecond you are allowed to lose focus. Everybody has to be on focus or it doesn't work. And I think everybody is very, very much aware of that, vocalist and instrumentalists alike in order to make this enormous piece of genius come to life. Um, and why, this is why it's also, uh, for me, always an incredible honor, a privilege to be able to conduct this work, to take that, that, those black notes off the paper and, and make them into the most colorful, most beautiful inspiration that, that known to mankind, you know? And by the way, Jake, that's exactly what you capture in your piece. So that's why I love I loved doing this. I think that if I ever do 
if, if uh, the Almighty grants me the opportunity to do this again, I think I'll always do it with your, your piece as a, as, a, cool. as a partner to it. It's really cool. it's spectacular. Very cool. Love Very cool. Love well, it. we just have seconds left in this pre-concert chat, but because I've had the privilege to participate in these pre-concert chats for a number of years now, which is kind of unbelievable that years, years and years is what it's been, I wanted to say to both of you, I remembered this pre-concert chat that we had once, and it was probably six or seven years ago. And I can't remember which terrible current event was going on, but someone in the audience, in the pre-concert chat asked a question and Ed had such a good answer to it. And I think uh, uh, both of you would, would agree with this. And the question was, you know, with all this terrible stuff going on, is it still important to for us to be in this you know hall and making music and having a symphony concert and there's always something like this we've been through these last two years you weren't even able to do this beethoven symphony because of the pandemic and now there's other wars that have started and i mean i think the answer that you gave at the time ed was perfect i can't remember it word for word but in a way really i i think you both could agree both of these pieces on this concert tonight could be the answer to that question that there, there is hope in this, that we need this even more in these times. And this, that had to do with the, the, the war in the Middle East, the Gulf War, yeah. um, because it was your piece, Jake, Dreams of the Fallen, mm -hmm. with Jeffrey right. Eagle as a, a, a piano soloist on, on, on that one. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, another, another such piece that is so intense and, and, and it has an incredible message, um, like as this one does. Uh, uh, I think one of the great things about what you do, Jake, is that you bring uh, a lot of our sub and unconscious level of thinking mm. and soul searching to the fore. And mm. it, it forces us into some kind of reconciliation of the good and the bad in the world, you know, which is of course, the, you know, throughout human history, the battle that we all go through. Yeah. And it's also one of the, the one of the great um, satisfactions or, or, or comfort, solace as it were in my life to have the privilege of being able to make the music, which helps keep some of that in balance. You know, and mm. I feel, and I think that most people at the moment feel that the the, the product of, of evil are raising its head a lot higher than what is good in the world at the moment. But I think that if there's anything that can be done, it is through music that we're gonna be able to do that. I, I really, I honestly, in my, yeah. in my heart of hearts, really believe that, that that, you know, we have, all kinds of things for our, our physical ills and we try to figure out ways of cure and all that. The, the soul and our spirit really do, we hunger, we ache for that remedy. And I think the greatest solace and remedy that we have at the moment is music. I really believe that. And when you merge the voice, the text, words with the universal language of music, is the most magical thing on earth that we have. I, I completely agree. You know, I think uh, if, if everyone made music together in the world, this would be a very different place. Yeah. And I think, you know, Beethoven really hit it in the letter just saying that it was art that sustained him. And I think for us, especially through the last two years, it's been art that has sustained us in so many ways. Um, so yeah, I, I agree with, with all that you're, you're saying, and uh, just and it, can't, it, can't wait to make music with y'all. You know, in our isolation through the last two years of the COVID, the pandemic, um, one of the greatest attributes that we have to turn back to is music. Whether yeah. we listen to it, whether we play it, whether we just study it, no matter what it is, there, there, we can reconnect to what is you know, really good in the world through our music. Beautiful. And that's why, as a composer, I, I lay it all at your feet, Jake. You know, <laughs> no pressure. No pressure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I do want to thank you know, our two uh, our choral directors for this, uh, um, uh, this evening's concert.
Tom Trenny and uh, Kurt Runestad. Uh, same namesake as, as Jake, by the way, yeah. and, and they actually are related, which was a total yeah. freak out for me years ago when I, when I discovered uh, that, uh, because yeah. I met Second them both. Cousins on, once removed, I think it is. Uh, it's yeah. just <laughs> great. It's just great. And they've done a magnificent, magnificent job. I just, I, I feel very honored to be able to, to, to make music with everybody on stage tonight. Fantastically huge concert. Beautiful music with Jake Runestad, composer of A Silence Haunts Me. Sorry, I'll say that again. A Silence Haunts Me. <laughs> and then also the Beethoven Nine with Full Forces Tonight, led by Ed Polachik. Jake and Ed, thank you so much. This has been a great pre-concert chat. Great honor. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Can't wait. And I hope everyone enjoys the concert tonight.